Hi, welcome everybody that's joining us today via Zoom. I see some people are starting to jump on. We'll go ahead and get started in just a few minutes. Um, if you want to tell us what your favorite destination is, you can put that in the chat. You can also put any questions for our presenters today in the uh, chat. Or let us know where you want to go next. In addition to those who registered for the event via Zoom, um, we are going to be pushing this out through Facebook Live. So you can share that information with friends. Um, after the recording, you'll be able to share that completely. We've got another virtual event later this evening. You can find that information on the uh, Penn State Alumni Association's web uh, web page. It's not too late to register. Information on all of our trips, of course, is also available on the Alumni Association's webpage. You can find details and booking directions um, at alumni.psu.edu. And then just click on the travel link at the top of the page. Going to give everybody just another minute or two. We still have people coming and joining us. It's beautiful weather here in Happy Valley for those of you who are not in the area. I think we're ready to get started now. So welcome to everybody who is joining us via Zoom. This is our fourth of our quarterly travel spotlights for 2022. I am Kelly Morganti, the Assistant Director of the Alumni Travel Program. As a reminder, this presenta presentation is being recorded and all viewers are on mute. We are also pushing this out through Facebook Live, so welcome to all of those viewers. Live closed captions are available for this event, and you can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom window, and then clicking the show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link, which we're going to go ahead and drop into the chat box in just a second. The Penn State Alumni Association has been offering group travel for over 50 years, working with some of the most experienced tour operators in affinity travel to compile a varied collection of tours visiting destinations around the world. Details on all of our upcoming tours are on our website at alumni.psu.edu backslash travel. 
Being accompanied by a Penn State faculty while on one of our trips is always an added bonus. And in 2023, we are fortunate to have four faculty members accompanying some of our groups. Dr. Peter Newman will be on the Wolves of Yellowstone trip. Dr. Gregory Drain on the Paris and African-American Experience Tour. Dr. Kirk French will be doing the Heartland Journey Bourbon Experience River Cruise. An assistant teaching professor from Penn State Altoona, Jared Frederick, will be doing the Easy Company England to the Eagle's Nest World War II trip. He will be joining me shortly. We've received several questions from those who pre-registered for today's event and will answer as many as we possibly can throughout the presentation. If you would like to submit any questions now, we invite you to do so via the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of the Zoom window, or in the comment section through Facebook. Following the live event, you can submit any questions via email to alumni travel at psu.edu. As I mentioned, we are honored to have Assistant Teaching Professor Jared Frederick join us today. Jared's passion for American history has led him to Civil War battlefields, frequent appearances on C-SPAN, PBS, World War II TV, Turner Classic Movies, and as host of the YouTube series, Real History. Of his multiple publications, his three most recent focus on World War II, in particular, The Band of Brothers. Welcome, Jared. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I'm glad that you're here with us today. Tell us a little bit about you and your passion for, for history. Well, as I always tell my students on the first day of class when they're when we're kind of doing icebreakers, uh, by the time I was in fifth grade, I knew I wanted to be a historian. Uh, and in fact, uh, in my seventh grade superlatives, I was voted the student most likely to be a college history professor. Uh, okay. And here I am. Uh, and so uh, I was either uh, very forward looking or my fellow students had a, a good sense of, of foresight, maybe a, a little bit of both. A little uh, bit of both, it sounds like. <laughs> uh, but as, uh, as I was in high school, I started to get more and more involved in the history field. Uh, I published my first book, albeit it was a, a kid's book, um, when I was 17 uh, years old. Uh, I started doing uh, various volunteer uh, activities and programs with the, the National Park Service. And uh, I ended up uh, going uh, to Penn State Altoona, the very place where I am teaching now. And uh, while I was there, I gained uh, a student internship with Gettysburg National Military Park. And that later led to employment there uh, as a park ranger with the Smokey the Bear hat and all. Uh, and that uh, evolved uh, to the, the point where I went from being a park ranger to a professor. And I, I like to think that my time teaching and reflecting in the great outdoors uh, has made me a, a more proficient educator in, in the classroom. Uh, so that, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I've, I'm not as well traveled as, as Nathan, uh, who will be uh, joining us shortly. Um, but I've done my fair share of traveling on World War II battlefields okay. and historic sites uh, around the country. And I look forward to sharing some of my insights and research and prior experiences with those who will be joining us. Well, I did not know about the kids book. That is that is new information. Um, I had gotten some information. I'm familiar with some of your your publications, I guess, since you've been um, a faculty member or, or an adult anyhow. Um, so you'll have to give us a little bit of information about that. But tell us about these three books that really kind of focus on the World War II. My last three books have uh, focused on the Second World War in Europe. Uh, the first of these was Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Invasion, which came out in the spring of 2019 in time for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And I really wanted to tackle this subject, although I wanted to do something a little bit different. Uh, and certainly there are no shortage of, of books on the Normandy invasion. And what I discovered is there was a great untapped resource in American newspapers oh. and how they reported the D-Day experience both at home and overseas. Uh, and so over the course of a year and a half, 
I transcribed about 300,000 words uh, in newspaper reports and firsthand eyewitness accounts of the Normandy invasion. Everything from the New York Times to Stars and Stripes to uh, small little hometown newspapers. And what I discovered was a story that had never been featured in any book. And that was this very organic bottom-up history of D-Day uh, as told by uh, people who we've never heard of. Uh, and so the amount of detail that combatants of D-Day wrote home, the information that got through the censors and then was reprinted in their local hometown newspapers uh, absolutely astounded me. And so, it's a reflection on personal experiences, and it is also a meditation on the importance of the free press and the First Amendment during wartime, okay. which American GI saw as a, a pillar of why they were fighting. Right. Uh, my next two books are uh, even more aligned with the subject matter of our tour, uh, and the first of those is Hang Tough, the World War II Letters and Artifacts of Major Dick Winters. Uh, my co-author, Eric Dorr, is the owner and curator of the Gettysburg Museum of History, where visitors can go and see uh, much of Major Winters' personal artifacts, uh, including his uh, jump uniform uh, that he wore uh, in various campaigns and other relics associated with I did not know that. Great. Uh, and he and I also teamed up for a sequel of sorts, uh, which examines a more mysterious member of Easy Company, and we can get into some more discussion on him as we progress, um, but that is the, the enigmatic but ever-dependable Ronald Spears, who was one of Dick Winters' successors as Easy Company. Uh, and so uh, that one is a lot of clarifying and a lot of myth-busting. Oh. Uh, what did this man of mystery do? What did he not do? How does it reconcile with the historical record and historical memory? Okay. Uh, and so that one was uh, quite the investigative journey, and I'm really pleased with uh, how fans of Band of Brothers have been responding to it. Well, and with Penn State does have a, a history with uh, World War II, um, uh, as, as far as, you know, like some of our more famous um, uh, soldiers from that time um, are represented here with a building named after one. Yes, uh, and I think it's a, a good place to start in recognizing the fact that, uh, like so many other aspects of American society, World War II was a transformative moment for our university. And one of the key problems uh, is that it, it lost much of its student body in early 1942 as men of military age were enlisting. And uh, the one photograph that we see here in the top left is uh, essentially uh, the, the ROTC officer candidate skull, uh, which was quite, quite prolific uh, during the war years. Uh, and this university, as well as other ones, thought of this novel idea uh, let's start to recruit more female students to fill the ranks of higher education. Uh, and so uh, for the first time ever, uh, the proportion of women in comparison to men at Penn State um, swayed in the other direction for oh. the first time. And in addition to that, uh, Penn State got a, a diversified uh, faculty uh, base um, because many of Penn State's professors in the 1940s and into the 1950s had actually been exiles and refugees from Europe. And uh, since the Nazis had kicked them out, uh, they brought their knowledge and expertise to places like Penn State. Uh, and so it was a, 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 both a, a demanding and uh, revolutionary time in the history of our university. Uh, but of course, uh, many of those students also did not come home. Right. And that brings us to the story of uh, the young lieutenant who we see here on the right. Uh, his name was Harry E. Wagner, and he was from the class of 1941. He was from the Harrisburg area, and he became an officer in the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment in the 82nd Airborne Division. And unfortunately, he is among a fairly substantial number of Penn Staters who lost their lives in the Second World War. Uh, and we are going to make an effort to pay homage at his gravesite in the Normandy American Cemetery overlooking Omaha Beach. Right. Uh, and then after the war, 
um, as we can get a sense of from the, the yearbook cover here, um, that's uh, the 1944 through 1946 yearbook. Um, because paper was being rationed, people's energies were elsewhere. And so uh, in 1946, when the war came to an end, they did a three-year volume, the likes of which have never been done otherwise in Penn State history. And so it's a very unique insider perspective to those war years. And I'll, uh, I'll share one more anecdote uh, in that regard, because uh, um, there were two President Eisenhower's in the 1950s. One was president of the country. And as some of you may know, there was also the president of our university, Milton Eisenhower, the namesake of Eisenhower Auditorium, at the University Park campus. And in 1955, uh, Milton invited his brother Dwight to come give the commencement speech at Penn State at what was then known as Beaver Field. And uh, Milton was uh, in a, a great emotional frenzy about the day because there was uh, re reports of bad weather and thunderstorms that, that might be approaching. And uh, so he asked his, his brother Eisenhower, Ike, uh, if, if they should proceed, if they should do the commencement outdoors. And uh, Ike rather nonchalantly uh, said, you worry about it. I haven't been concerned about weather since June 6, 1944. And that is a favorite story of the Eisenhower family uh, to this very day. Um, the, the, the pressure of prioritizing things in the eyes of these two brothers. And so it, it certainly gives a, a great level of perspective. Yeah, well, and if, go ahead. Oh, well, rumor has it that the whole reason that University Park has its own zip code was because um, the, uh, the the two Eisenhower brothers' mother wanted to be able to mail stuff directly to Milton. So whether that's true or not, I don't know. It almost doesn't matter because it's <laughs> so great a story. It is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if, if folks are looking for a good primer uh, mm -hmm. to get uh, energized further for this trip, um, right now, at our all sports museum yeah. at Beaver Stadium. Um, there is a two year exhibit uh, that is currently on display called I am a Penn Stater, Nittany Lions in World War II. Uh, and so that's just a, a great um, a beginner uh, chapter, so to speak, um, to uh, get you further primed up for the journey that we'll be taking. Yep, and that's located, that museum is actually located in Beaver Stadium. In the All Sports Museum, yep. that's correct. Yep, it's it's very easy to get to. So yeah, I highly recommend that you go visit that when you're when you're here in Happy Valley. So um, well, let's go ahead um, along with Jared um, joining us from Normandy, France. Of you know, seems pretty fitting today is Nathan Hegan. He is the director of educational travel for the National World War World War II Museum located in New Orleans. Nathan also has uh, participated in C-SPAN and Real History broadcasts and works closely with universities and schools to develop overseas learning opportunities. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here and on the deck of a cruise ship in uh, Rouen, France. Uh, we'll be uh, tracking to the Normandy beaches tomorrow, actually, with my last uh, tour group of the season. That's perfect. There are certainly worse places that you can be than... Uh, in France right now, I would think. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about the National World War II Museum, um, and then a little bit how you became involved. Yeah, so we're very, very unique among tour operators in, in the world, really. We are a national museum and an international tour operator at the same time. So we operate between 40 and 50 World War II themed tours a year across Europe, North Africa, and Asia Pacific. Uh, so I've done things in the Philippines, uh, Japan, South Pacific, Australia, uh, Morocco, and, and all the way through, through Europe. But the story of how we got here goes back to the two men you see on the top center of the picture here, uh, Dr. Stephen Ambrose and Dr. Nick Mueller, the founders of the museum. And, you know, we have our own legends about, about the founding of the museum, but it really tracks to a day in the 1980s when doctors Ambrose and Mueller were drinking sherry at a backyard barbecue and Ambrose as he was interviewing veterans for his books kept saying here's the helmet here's a here's this other thing brought back from Germany here you want my uniform and they thought you know let's build a little museum at the University of New Orleans on the lakefront campus it'll probably cost us a million dollars let's 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 just do it and uh, so that was about 1985. 15 years later, 
they opened a D-Day museum in downtown New Orleans, about nine blocks from the French Quarter and Bourbon Street, and opened it with a gigantic parade that had trucks and floats for every unit that was involved in Normandy uh, coming by. Uh, Tom Hanks was there and, and got a lot of notoriety around the nation. Um, then the museum continues to expand. So we were just a national D-Day museum, just focused on Normandy. Come 2004, we receive a congressional designation to become America's National World War II Museum. Oh and this was in Congress by Senators Daniel Inouye of Hawaii and Ted Stevens of Alaska, with other support from Bob Dole of Kansas, because they realized that if they trusted the federal government to build a World War II museum, there wouldn't be a veteran alive to see it. So better to, to support the private museum in New Orleans that had done such a job on D-Day and to do this expansion, which if you track the $1 million they thought they'd spend on a museum on the lakefront, we're about 600 times that in right now on expanding across nine city blocks in New Orleans with the exhibits like you're seeing here, uh, the, the Freedom Pavilion on the top left with the aircraft on display, our original pavilion on the top right, and then the thematic immersive galleries like the Hedgerows of Normandy on the bottom left, uh, the closest you'll get until you see the real thing on your, on your trip. And then uh, other, other uh, immersive exhibits like what you see on the bottom right and the aircraft inside from an aerial view looking at a P-51 underneath the wing of a, of a B-17 also looking toward a B-25. So it's quite a, quite a journey into a museum. And if we can look at the next picture, it really begins with Dr. Ambrose and Band of Brothers and how this tour has such a special place in the history of the museum. That it was Ambrose's interviews with Dick Winters and Don Malarkey and Ed Tipper that formed the basis of this book. And it happened through a random occurrence where Ambrose happened upon a reunion of these guys and took down their stories and it turned into this book. And what we're able to do now is to visit the places that are most significant in this book from the training in Aldburn, England to the landings in Normandy and the taking of causeways, the neutralizing of gun batteries and hedgerows. Where were these individuals? How did they tell these stories many, many years later in most instances? Going into the Netherlands to Operation Market Garden uh, continuing into the south, uh, toward the south of France, into Alsace-Lorraine, uh, going to Hagenau, and then trekking across Germany uh, to uh, first Dachau, and then to the final stops in Berchtesgaden and the Eagle's Nest. And along the way, we're able to bring in stories from our oral histories, from the ones that Dr. Ambrose did, to the ones that we have in our own collection, uh, some of which are available online uh, today. So it's such an important historical tour, both for the visitors, the guests who get to go on it, and for us in the museum who continue to refine this based on, on more of our findings and research. Well, and this book then turned into a, a really a pulp culture icon um, with, with the, um, I believe it was the HBO miniseries. Yeah, yeah, so 2001, and we just had a symposium in New Orleans this past August to commemorate the 20th year of that, um, of that miniseries. And so what's happened, there are no more members of Easy Company left. Uh, the last veteran, uh, Brad Freeman from uh, North Mississippi passed away uh, just earlier this year uh, in, in late June. Uh, so he wasn't able to attend, but we have made such friends with the actors who in turn had connected so well with the veterans and their families. So these actors are now parts of Babe Efron's family or Bill Guarnier's family. And, and, you know, they visit each other. Some of these actors are British and yeah, yeah they look, took a lot of voice lessons to get down a <laughs> Brooklyn accent. Uh, they have such a connection to the history from what they did to bring it to the screen. And they get to tell these stories of you know, how, did, how did you make these trees explode? How they, was that real or was that special effects? And so you watch a series here's the actor who was under a tree that's exploding in the woods. And he, he'll tell you about how they did it and how many takes they did. And if they could only do one take, because this tree can only explode one time. Uh, so you get, you get a lot of those stories on this tour. And it's, it's such a rewarding experience in so many ways. That is so, that is so great. You know, and I'm, so, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm, so looking forward to this whole conversation between you and, and Jared that I'm really just going to turn the program over to the two of you right now and let's let's talk about Easy Company. Let's do it. 
I, I, want, I want to start though with with Jared is I have like the Godfather up on the screen right now and 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 this book that uh, um, started so much and in, in that mini series I just spoke about. So Jared, how did what brought you into this to sort of bring in this next generation of research onto these guys? Well, I was first exposed to their story, not through the book, but the miniseries. And I suspect that's true of most people who are familiar with their story. Um, but I can give you almost an exact answer when it all began. It started in August of 2002 when my family got an HBO subscription. And that summer, HBO was airing one of many reruns of the series. And so once a week, um, I had my VCR set. I'm really dating it, it here. You know how long ago that was. Uh, but I, I was like so many other people. I was just really captivated by the story. Um, and, and so much so to the extent that uh, my fellow classmates in high school were even catching reruns of it on television as well. And it was a point of conversation around the cafeteria table at high school. Um, there's not many historical films that have that sort of power among young people, in my mind, at least. And as I look back all those years ago, never could I have imagined um, you know, that teenage kid sitting there at that cafeteria table would have the opportunity to meet these people, to learn about their stories, to examine their papers, to analyze their artifacts. Uh, and so it, it, it dominoed from there. And it, it culminated in the, the meeting with uh, a man who has since become a good friend of mine and a co-author, uh, and that is Eric Dorr. When I was a park ranger at Gettysburg, I was a frequent visitor to his museum. Uh, both he and I have a, a shared interest in both the Civil War and the Second World War. And he, um, he really appreciated my, my D-Day book. And accordingly, he, he approached me uh, about a possible book project about Dick Winters when he acquired much of his collection a, a number of years ago. And I, I was very intimidated by that at first because firstly, I thought, what could possibly be written about Dick Winters that already hasn't been written? He was the subject of three books by that point. Um, but as I began to read his letters to a female pen pal named Dieta Allman, I realized that there was a whole other side of him that I had not seen in the miniseries. Uh, that it, what we see in the miniseries is how his men see him as this uh, stoical, always forward thinking individual. Um, but in his wartime letters, we, we get a sense of vulnerability and also a degree of humor uh, that we often didn't take into account. Um, and so I I like to think that I, I contributed a little something to, to further our understanding of this man. And the same is true of uh, Ronald Spears and his many mysteries and even controversies. You there, Nathan? Yeah, yeah sorry, I just okay. had a... a I'm on, so being on the on the deck of a cruise ship is a little difficult, so I just got back on. So. Understood. Um, so I heard I heard you you mention uh, as I got cut off for a little bit. Uh, Spears, I want to go back to Dick Winters and, and an experience I just had on a tour in Okinawa where we were discussing General Buckner, the highest ranking American to be killed by enemy fire. And there's a line in some of the things written about him that he was so beloved by his men. But we had a discussion on the tour about can a general really be beloved by his men? And what we ended up looking at was the core of the American army in World War II, the commanders who were beloved and who were significant were those company commanders. And in your research into Dick Winters, what, where did, how did you really see that coming through? Winters was always trying to draw a line for himself. Um, he writes continuously in his correspondence home that he was trying not to become emotionally attached to his men. He said there has to be a dividing line between officers and non-commissioned officers. Uh, and he was constantly preaching this, yet he constantly broke his own advice. It became impossible for him not to become attached to these men. Uh, because as many people suggest, uh, he was the biggest brother of the Band of Brothers. 
Uh, these men looked up to him in an almost paternalistic uh, sort of manner, and he looked at them in some ways uh, as if they were his children, to which he was responsible for their care and their, their stewardship. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's really how he looked at it. And when uh, that, that sort of family dynamic that you find within a small unit is a double-edged sword um, because it builds a sense of trust, it creates a degree of affinity, but it creates all the more pain and hardship when some of those men are inevitably killed in action. And he reflects on these things and so much more in his letters. And so in your, your research into the Winters and Spears and the rest of the men of Easy Company, what surprised you about these individuals? What's the, what, what did you not expect to find out about them or their views on the war? As I briefly mentioned before, one thing that surprised me the most about Winters was his sense of humor. Um, he has some great jokes uh, that he writes about in these letters. He has some hilarious things to say about the other branches of service, uh, especially the United States Navy, um, which was a, a, a common point of ridicule um, in his letters. And uh, he, he curses, he swears, he complains. Uh, it, you, you really see this private side of him come out. Um, in many ways, there were two sides to his life. Um, he had a very public face. He was a very avid uh, booster of the men of Easy Company and getting their story out there. And he was as stoical as could be in front of a camera. Uh, but in some of his letters, uh, you see him at ease a little bit more so. And uh, it, it makes him all the more human and accessible and approachable as a consequence. Uh, with, with somebody like Ronald Spears, uh, a lot of people uh, have the opinion of him as he's this, this highly functional sociopath. Uh, that, that's how a lot of people think of him. Uh, and, and I would argue that it's a little bit more complicated than that, that there's a greater degree of nuance and complexity uh, to his exploits. Uh, did he do the things that some men claim that he did on the battlefield? Did he kill one of his own men? Did he execute German prisoners of war? Well, I, you'll have to come on the tour to find out quite naturally. Uh, but uh, what we did is that we, we did a compare and contrast of all of these accounts, both published and unpublished. And we were able to come to, I think, very valid conclusions uh, based on the, the evidence available, uh, and also some admissions to things that Spears did as he wrote letters to Dick Winters. Uh, and so, so much of this would not have been possible had Dick Winters himself not been an amateur historian, uh, because he religiously kept files on his men. He had file cabinets in his house. He maintained personnel files for another 60 years after the war ended. Uh, and so uh, without Dick Winters and his uh, sense of foresight um, and his ability to prioritize and record, um, none of these stories would have been possible. He, he's, he's the root uh, of it all. He's why we're here. So on, on the tour, Jared, where are you most looking forward to going? Um, I have been to some of these battlegrounds, although not all of them. And I am really looking forward to visiting Holland and a lot of the sites associated with Operation Market Garden. I have uh, read and researched about them extensively, um, but it's long been on my bucket list and uh, this trip is part of a dream come true. And uh, we have a slide uh, that, that shows a group outside of a Schonderluk farm. Uh, I can't do a Dutch G to save my life, but uh, so this this will be one of the places that Jared will be standing. And you see our group here is one, one of, many groups that we've taken with our little logo in the middle. But aside from that, if you just hit that button, you'll see a man pop up. So Jared's got to bring a helmet with him and pose exactly like this at the same spot when Dick Winters visits a command post um, at this very farm um, in, in during uh, Operation Market Garden. So this is a photo that gets recreated uh, many, many times on, on our tours. And so I, I expect to see a helmet coming along with you. Okay, I'll do my best to smuggle it through customs. <laughs> Check luggage only. Check yes, luggage. yes, indeed.
indeed. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, might I pose some questions to you? Absolutely. Um, I think this photo is a really good segue for the, the first question I had in mind. Um, and I, I think part of this is already self-explanatory, but um, how will visiting these sites enrich people's understandings of what they've read or what they've watched about the Band of Brothers? I, it's, it's a kind of answer on all of our tours. You're going to learn that things are a lot more complicated than they are in a book or in a series, that an author has a challenge to distill an enormous amount of information into something that people want to read. And there's only so many words you can put on the page and in a certain way to keep the, the author engaged or to keep the audience engaged. And, but the complexity is so much more than that. But when you're standing in a field, let's say Breakor Manor, uh, the end of episode two, the assault on a gun battery in a hedgerow in a field, when you're standing in the field and you realize, okay, Utah Beach is that direction and they were assaulted from that road and they observed it from here and another unit had tried to do it and went back that way. And you, when you start to get the directions and you, you start to understand more than what the printed word can, can tell you. And, and uh, I, I choose Breakor Manor because it's such a, a fun place to visit because it's not a museum. It's not an, an interpreted site. You're not looking at panels and pictures while you're there. You're in the actual field uh, owned by the grandson of the wartime owner, and it's a dairy farm, and there's cows there, and sometimes the cows are in the field. Sometimes they're moving them field to field. The next field over is uh, horses that they're breeding to hopefully get to graduate in Versailles someday and be in fancy parades, and you're on a man's farm, and then you start to realize that you think of war on these preset determined battlefields or something along those lines, but it's not, it's, this was somebody's backyard. And then when you finish talking to the owner, when you finish talking to Charles, he will tell you that this battle made TV. It made a book and it made it to TV, but this happened in dozens of fields from here to Cherbourg. And we just told you about one of them. And the decisions that somebody like Dick Winters had to make in that action was repeated by company commanders all across Normandy and eventually all across Europe. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, you know, I, I have similar conversations with my students when I take them to Gettysburg, uh, kind of a, a more uh, regional instance for us in Pennsylvania. Um, and for many of them, it's their first time going there. And they have a whole new understanding of when they go and when they walk the grounds in person. Uh, and I, I constantly preach this to my students. If you want to understand history, you have to go to the places where it actually happened. Um, there is no better way of learning and understanding and appreciating what was done at these places than going to see it for yourself. Uh, so along those lines, um, you and I will not be the only historians on this trip. Um, and we will also be joined by some other special individuals as well. Perhaps you can uh, shed some insight on who else will be uh, joining us on this adventure. Yeah, so, so we bring in uh, local guides at each location. So I, you know, I know the big stories. I've been to Normandy plenty of times. But what I don't have is the personal family connections of being in Normandy or being in France during the war, where the guides who you meet will start telling you about their grandparents and what their grandparents went through. And, you know, the, the, this complex situation of resistance and collaboration and the people who are just going to live with whatever happened. And you get this picture of French society while we're in Normandy. Then we move on to the Netherlands and we'll pick up our, our guide. We'll take us all the way through. And you get that same thing again. These are individuals who live in the towns that were restored after these battles. And so they're telling you that, that you know, that this farm here, they, they're family friends for the last, you know, 100 years or so that these families have known each other. Or my grandfather went to school with this house, the owner of this house that was destroyed, and now it's back, but they left several bricks that had bullet holes in them. And if you come around the side of the house, I'll show them where you I'll show them to you now. And those are the things that the, only the local guides can really bring. Um, I can trespass and make friends all I want, but it doesn't substitute for having people whose families have these kind of connections and their passion for history uh, at the same time. And uh, 
they just bring so much to it. And then I, I briefly mentioned the actors. They've almost become historians of this company in their own right. Um, they're, they're funny, they're engaging. Uh, because they're actors, they can also do great impressions. Um, the, uh, the, the actor who plays, uh, uh, Jared, I'm blanking on the, 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 the guy's name, the one that did the impressions um, all the time um, in the series. Anyway, the actor who plays the soldier who does impressions, the act, that actor will do impressions for you the whole tour. He'll just pick somebody and do it. And, and they, they really help when the tour gets really heavy after a visit to a cemetery or really treacherous battlefield. The actors help bring the morale of the tour back up over time. And, and eventually you're, you're back getting ready for dinner in Eindhoven or um, Berchtesgaden or uh, Normandy or wherever you are again. And, and you're able to start talking in, in regular conversations again as you processed what you just witnessed throughout the whole day. That's, that's, that's great. That's, that sounds like uh, the, the perfect balance of uh, enlightenment and entertainment, I think. Uh, um, similarly, uh, what are some good ways that uh, potential participants on the tour can uh, can prepare? What what would you suggest? Uh, how how can they come best equipped to get the most out of their experience? Uh, so, well, the first you'll want to read the book and watch the miniseries if you haven't already. I know most most people have, but you want you want to brush up on it um, a little more. And and if you have the DVD versions or the Blu-ray of of Band of Brothers, the supplemental material that's on there starts getting you into the, the mode of how they filmed this. And, and, and that's a, an interesting facet that comes in the tour. It's probably, I'd say 15% of what we end up talking about is how you bring these World War II stories to the screen. And when you bring them to the screen, every little thing, and, and um, I've, I've been having a little bit to do with the Masters of the Air miniseries with some authors and uh, film crews I've worked with over time, when they filmed Masters of the Air, which will be releasing in Apple TV next year uh, about the 8th Air Force in England, if there's two characters talking in a workshop and there's a table next to them and there's a wrench on that table, that wrench might be on screen for 3.2 seconds, but it is a wrench that would have been available to an air crew in England in 1943. And that level of detail is, is what goes into, into a lot of these. Um, I'd say aside from, you know, brushing up on the, the core concept material, we're going to send you a map book and absorb that map book and bring that map book with you because the, the tour continues to get more complicated as you leave Normandy. And Normandy, when you're standing on the beach, a battle is easy to understand. Good guys are coming from the water, the bad guys are behind you. When you leave the beaches, things get more difficult. When you start talking about crossroads towns, if you look at your map book, you'll see what we mean by a crossroads town. They're not laid out on grids like country roads in the US are, where every, about every mile you'll have another cross, another intersection. These are spoken hub. So you have a, a town like St. Mary Glees or a town like Bastogne. It is the center of a spoke and all the roads from the fields lead into the center where the market would take place. That's great for farmers getting their stuff to a market. It's terrible for an army trying to bypass a congested downtown. And to understand why certain towns have the battles they do, the maps are essential in, in that. So we'll send you those map books, but really, really dig in and look and, and try to figure out if I was trying to plan an invasion or an operation here, how would I try to do this? Good insight. Uh, speaking of location, I'll, I'll throw back the, the question that you asked to me. Uh, what's your favorite location on this tour and why? Um, I, I talked a lot about Breakcore Manor, and that, that's a fun one because you're in the field and, and it's where things uh, took place. But for me, um, I, I also enjoy the Market Garden part because it's, it's eye-opening. And where it really starts to hit for me is in a little town called Noonan. And if you're an art fan, uh, it's Van Gogh's birthplace. Um, so you get a little culture in there too. We'll take you to where Van Gogh was born. But when you're in Noonan, you can't see that the war took place there until you go to the side of a house or until you go down a little street. And then you start to find the, the, the remembrance points. So I, for me, it's Noonan because that's the point in the tour at which I'm leaving 
the Normandy mindset and I'm really, really getting into the weeds now and I'm really starting to learn about canals and bridges and, and the, the intricacy of an operation. And, and right from the very first bridge that we visit in Operation Market Garden, I'm already starting to learn why there's one that's too far. And honest, honestly, the first bridge we visit is Noonan and that one was probably too far. This, uh, this is getting me quite excited for uh, the, the trip and I suspect that the same is true of uh, other people uh, tuning in. Uh, that's about all the questions that, that I have for you, Nathan. That's uh, really great insight, great perspective, a great overview uh, of the tour. Um, so we'll have Kelly rejoin us here and yeah, if we uh, could, we'll get into uh, some questions. So a few other things. So we do the honor uh, we mentioned with the uh, Penn State and the alums that we'll honor in, in a cemetery. We'll visit three. And this is one of the easy company members, uh, Warren Muck. And when we don't have an alum from a school, we go to the easy company grave sites and you'll hear their stories repeated uh, throughout. So as you watch, and this one is particularly compelling in that um, you'll just have watched the episode in which Muck and Pencala are killed in a foxhole in Bastogne. And the next day you're at this uh, gravesite. So it's, it's, it, they're very moving parts to this. But as you go to the, uh, to the next one, um, we do visit a lot of cemeteries and here is uh, uh, Wagner uh, that we spoke about earlier. We'll work this one in, in Normandy and we'll visit three cemeteries. And I've often had guests say, I came on this tour and I thought I was going to be visiting battlefields and crying in cemeteries all day, but we do end up in some very nice places. And the final slide here will show you that the, the groups do have fun uh, at the very end and uh, meeting with dressed up in their later hosen and dirndls at the end. And um, some people, this is the lake in, in uh, Zellum Sea that uh, Dick Winters jumps into and swims. And uh, this October, we actually had four people jump in to try to recreate that. And uh, as they got out, the only word they said was cold. So, but dress up nice. You'll have great food, great experiences, fantastic hotels as well. Yeah, well, gentlemen, thank you both so much for your time today. Um, the work that you do is is both fundamental in the preservation of history and quite honestly, how we live today. Um, I've been watching some of the comments on Facebook and we've had a number of our viewers who have been to these sites and, and highly recommend the Band of Brothers and reading the book and watching the series um, and going back and visiting. We had one gentleman who said he's been to some of these places and he would gladly go back again. Um, my son actually just mentioned to me the other day that he's in the process of re-watching the miniseries. So, so it's certainly something that is still very, very popular. We did have several questions that were submitted ahead of time, um, and we're going to go over some of those really quickly. Um, Julia had asked about the complete itinerary and the cost, which we're going to pop up here. Uh, the, store, the tour actually starts in London on June 25th, so it would be a departure from the U.S. on the 24th. Um, and of course, you can see that it, it travels over to Normandy, up uh, into the Netherlands, Belgium, um, down through Luxembourg, Germany, um, and then finishes up in Zellum C, or where you would fly out of Munich on July 7th. Um, full itinerary is there. Of course, all of this is also available on our website. Uh, total cost um, for the tour, not including air, is $6,995 per person. That is based on double occupancy. If you do want to travel as a solo traveler, you can do that. Um, have your own room, and that comes in um, with, a, with a supplement um, of about um, $2,500. So again, all that information is on our website. As far as what's included um, in the tour, I mean, Nathan had mentioned that, you know, there's a map that's included. You do have a full-time logistical tour manager that travels with you. Um, local guides that come in um, in different locations. Of course, you have the expertise of Nathan and of Jared on this trip. Uh, round trip air tour. Uh, airport transfers can be arranged. Um, they do have a, a time frame that you can do that. And again, the World War II Museum can help set up your air and they can talk to you about all of that. Uh, boutique hotel accommodations um, in prime locations, uh, private motor coach, you won't be traveling by any public transportation. There is VIP access to these sites, entrance fees to all the museums and historical attractions. Um, 
we, they do provide a personal listening device. So sort of like a Vox that you can, so you, if you, if you aren't right up with them when they um, are, your guides are speaking, you can still hear them. Um, gratuities to the guides, drivers, porters, and all the servers for the included meals. You can see it's a pretty extensive meals that are included in this. Um, and then you'll get a luggage tag and name badge, but you, the, that informative map is really very helpful to take with you, um, even once you study it at home. Um, we also have, um, somebody had what had asked about the, the air. Um, air can be arranged from um, the airport of your choosing. So where, no matter where you live, you can say where you wanna fly from. World War II Museum can help set that up for you. Group size for this is about 34 travelers um, maximum. They, um, we don't wanna overcrowd the buses and um, have the group too large that you don't feel you're getting you know, a, a, a good amount of information. Uh, Dan has asked about arriving early. Um, there is a pre-tour option uh, that includes three nights accommodations um, called Churches London. Uh, Nathan, can you talk a little bit about that program? Yeah, so it gets into the life and decisions that Winston Churchill had to make during World War II. Uh, it starts with a visit to Churchill, his country home, uh, the gardens, very peaceful thing. You get to learn about Churchill the man uh, as you're, you're visiting there. And then the next day, the uh, fantastic Imperial War Museum uh, that, you know, giving a half day to it, we're able to accomplish about a fourth of it, but it's the fourth that is relevant to World War II. Uh, the exhibits are brand new as of uh, 2021, late 2021. The Second World War and the Holocaust exhibits have been completely redone. So if you've been to the Imperial War Museum in London before, the Second World War and the Holocaust are an entirely new experience for you to go through, as well as a complete refresh of their World War I uh, exhibits. And the Churchill War Rooms, the Cabinet War Rooms underneath 10 Downing Street, um, very special visit. You'll be walking the same corridors that Churchill and his cabinet walked through underneath London as they plotted out the uh, uh, liberation of Europe um, while ensuring that their own, uh, London's own survival uh, from underground. So it's a neat tour. Um, it's a bit more relaxed. It's less people. Uh, you'll get to, as you're driving around, you'll get to know and understand a lot more about uh, wartime London as well. Wonderful. Um, Michelle is asking, we were talking about some of the walking and stuff. Michelle is asking about how much strenuous walking is involved in the tour, because you will be on some battlefields. And of course, um, you know, London, London streets are not necessarily, uh, you know, like state college streets. Um, so how much strenuous walking is involved with this? So I think on, on tours that I normally do, now that people have step counters on their phones, I get up-to-date information every day. Yes, uh, we, we average between I'd say 8,000 and 10,000 steps on a busy day, but that's through the whole day, uh, not, not all at once, and it's not all strenuous. Um, a lot of the sites we visit, say Omaha Beach in Normandy, for example, you have the chance to walk on the beach for as much as you want to. And depending on the tides, if it's low tide, you'll have 400 yards of beach. If it's high tide, you'll be up on the seawall. Um, so a lot of the walking, because we use the box listening devices, the walking tends to vary, but I would say prepare for uh, three miles at a moderate stroll uh, throughout the course of an entire day. So obviously not all at once, not all at one stop, but over the course of a day when it's a particularly busy uh, day. Okay, great, great. Um, one other ones that we have is um, Vincent was curious about how much time we'll be spending at each location. Now we've talked sort of offline about sort of incorporating some of the stops um, that Penn Staters are, have a history at, um, you know, Mr. Wagner in particular, um, but about how much time do you spend at each location? So if, if I'll, I'll kind of break this into uh, categories. So a battle site can be anywhere from 20 minutes to 45 minutes. So at the scene of a particular action. So Breakhorn Manor, for example, leans toward that 45 minutes. Um, a bridge for Operation Market Garden, uh, 15 minutes to a maximum 20 minutes for the bridges over some of the smaller canals. Uh, the bridge at Nijmegen over the Vol River could be you know, 30 minutes or so. Uh, museums are typically the time that we release people to let them see things at their own pace. 
uh, roughly one to one and a half hours, depending on the museum. Uh, cemetery visits last between uh, one and one and a half hours as well. Um, some days with this, you saw the map, it's quite a trek across Europe. So there are some days that are largely driving days. Uh, going from Normandy to Eindhoven uh, takes the bulk of the day with a, with a stop for lunch in between. So there are some days that are, you'll get completely rested on, on this as well. And some days where you're doing you know, six to seven stops to see key battle sites that'll eventually fit together to form a whole on the picture of a battle. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and then while on the buses, then there's going to be got since the guides travel with you, there'll be some talks going on on the buses also. So it won't all just be, you know, quiet time, um, but you, you, some more educational yeah. opportunities. You'll have seen the entire Band of Brothers miniseries along with explanations, answering follow up questions of all of that taking place on the bus. Fantastic. Well, I think that's all that we have for today. Um, you know, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of questions on this. Um, once again, you know, if you want to make a reservation or you want to you get more details, you can visit our website. I hope everybody enjoyed today's presentation. I certainly did. Um, this has probably been one of my favorite, um, just sort of listening to to them talk back and forth. Um, Nathan and, and Jared is, are just a wealth of information. Um, I may have to make a drive out to the Altoona campus soon, you know, investigate one of his classes, um, maybe this coming spring. Um, but I wanna go ahead and thank everybody who registered and joined us. Um, take a look at our webpage for more virtual opportunities. Like I said, we do have a paint night coming up tonight. You can still jump in on. Details for this trip, all of our trips, all of our upcoming trips um, are on our website at alumni.psu.edu backslash travel. Gentlemen, thank you once again. And on that, I'll say I hope to travel with you all soon and have a great night. Bye now. Thank you. Curry.